There's a light, come on. Am I on? Oh, yeah. Well, it's good to be here. It's good to see you guys. I tell you what, y'all guys have been a blessing to us from the beginning. I think most of y'all weren't here, but some of y'all were. Y'all were the third church that took me on. And a lot of folks, I'd go in and say, well, we just don't know about this guy. But, but I tell you what, God has been faithful to us. I tell you, yeah. he's looked after me, and, and I am the most unqualified, unlikely person that God would ever call to the mission field. But I tell you what, a lot of y'all guys know me for a long time, and we ain't going to say no, that's as far as we're going to go with that. <laughs> a lot of these guys, we ain't going to say nothing else. But a quick update, the last time Carla and I were here, well, we were here Sunday night, but the last time before we left the country was the Sunday right when the COVID stuff was starting. And I remember, and our flight was going back, and I asked Cody, Pastor Cody, I said, will y'all pray Carla and I are going? But he said, y'all going back tomorrow? So when Carla and I got to the airport the next morning, we walked in Charlotte Airport, there was nobody there. And we walked up to the kiosk, going to do her thing, the guy behind the counter said, I don't mess with that thing, come on up here. He said, where y'all going? We said, we're going to Managua, Nicaragua. And he said, oh, I don't know. But he said, let me look. And he done look. And he said, man, y'all's flight has gone all the way through. So Carla and I and about seven other people flew from Charlotte to Miami by ourselves. We had a private jet almost <laughs> to Miami. And then we got to Miami and flew to Managua. And usually that thing has 250 people on it. They might have been 50 people on there. And we walked into the airport and made it everything through. And the next day, they shut the airport down to international travel. What I'm trying to say is every little thing, and we don't understand, God is working in our life. So much, I mean, that's just such a simple thing to get there before the airport closed. But it, I couldn't have got out, got back in for at least a year. I wouldn't have been able to minister, do anything for at least a year. But God got us there one day ahead of time. Flew us down there on a private jet and, and just to get us in there. And not only that, I have been working on my residence because I used to could stay nine months at the time, then they would make me leave the country. But after they had a, they tried to overthrow the government a couple of years ago, our State Department would make me come home every 90 days because they was afraid for me, for all Americans down there. If you weren't didn't have your residence, you had to come home every 90 days. So we got in, shut the airport down. I thought, man, what am I going to do now? And I had talked to a lawyer about getting my residence. And we went, and I had been trying for four years. I had a stack of papers from this thing about here and two deep I had been working on for years. And the lady come through and looked at him and said, well, you're still short one. And my lawyer said, wait a minute. He went outside and printed something up and laid it down. The lady looked at him and said, boom, approved. So I was allowed to stay in the country all that time. If I wouldn't have, once, once they opened up, I would have been in violation of my visa. I would have probably been deported and kicked out of the country. So all these little things like that, God was working each and everything to where I could stay there and work all this time. So Carla and I, we got home the first, that's the first time we've been home since March the 23rd, 2020. And, God, and since we've been gone, quick little update, when we left, we hadn't even started our second church yet. And as of last December, it worked out. Somebody, a friend of mine said, well, here, take this. It was just enough money to buy the land. We had looked in town, and they were selling little lots not much bigger than this place. We're there, and y'all was acquire a loft and everything for like $15,000, just little stuff you couldn't even put a church on. And we thought, well, man, we don't have that kind of money. And one of my pastor's friend he went to school with said, well, well, I got some land I'm trying to sell. And went and it was two acres. So God, God worked it out where instead of getting a spot no bigger than this, he gave us two acres for the same price. And, and, and a friend of mine, I had went to his church, and we had talked about them. And after we got the land, I got an email, and they said, well, brother, we got $30,000 here. You think you can build a church for that? <laughs> We got an estimate, and it was $29,800 for the, so God had worked it out, and we've got our second church going, and uh, that's just a quick little update, and, and I'll, I'll go ahead and speak some more about what was going on in the message, but if you would go ahead and, and get your Bibles and turn to the uh, second book of, second epistle of Timothy in chapter 1, 
And, and as you're turning, I'll tell you this right quick. When we started our second church, my father-in-law had almost died. I told this in, in, in Joshua's circle. And, and he, my church had actually sent me the money to buy his coffin. That's how bad my father-in-law was. And when they sent me that money, and he got bad, and I told Carl, I said, we're going to take that money they sent to buy a coffin, and we're going to try to save that man's life. And wound up, he did. He lived, and he was sitting at my house one day, and he was helping me and Carla make some food bags up for our church. And he said, Donnie, he said, uh, God didn't bring me through all that to sit here and read my Bible and not get nothing done. He said, I've led four folks to the Lord in La Paz Central, his hometown. And he said, will you help me start a church? And I said, well, let me pray about it. Same thing you did tonight when you asked me to speak tonight. And I said, well, let me pray about it. And the same thing happened. About two seconds later, God hit me upside the head and said, that's what you're here for, to build a church. And that's what I'm here for, to try to proclaim Amen. the gospel to the best of my ability. Amen. And anyway, we started that church with four four saved folks, and sometimes we'll run over a hundred now in, in our new building. That. And God, God took that man who almost died and put a, a desire and burn in his heart to start a church and put this old gringo along with him to help him get it going. And we've seen many souls saved. And if you would here in the first chapter uh, uh, of 2 Timothy, let me get my speak tickles out here so I can read this thing. In verse 12, it said, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know who I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Let us pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you tonight. Lord, I pray that you help me to bring this message. Lord, I can't do anything, but I can do all things that Christ has strengthened me. Lord, these folks tonight are tired, they've worked, they've hurting. There's a lot of folks who are depressed and, and discouraged and downtrodden. Lord, I can't do anything, but Lord, through your word and your spirit, Lord, lift us up tonight. May I say something that will encourage somebody, strengthen somebody. Lord, we need you tonight. In Jesus' name. Woo! Amen. I'm about to take a lap there. <laughs> do what? <laughs> But, but I thought, as I read this, I thought about what things have I committed unto Christ. I remember the first thing I had to commit to him before I could ever do anything else, before I could do any work, do anything, teach any Sunday school, do anything at all, I had to commit my soul to Christ. Amen. I remember the other night this brother was singing, Peace, Peace, Wonderful Peace. I hadn't heard that song in years, brother. And that song right there is special to me because I had a Christian mother, and she would come down to my house, and she would see me in all sorts of states that I shouldn't have been in in to begin with. And she would cry and she'd say, son, you're breaking my heart. It's killing me to see you live like this. I'm praying for you. Lord, son, you need to give your life to the Lord. I'm, it's killing me. And I'd say, mama, go home. I don't want to hear it. Kind of like somebody told you. It, it, and man, I look back now what I've done to that precious lady. But boy, she didn't give up. She kept on, and she kept on, and man, I went through a really hard time, and she'd come down and say, well, you know what you need to do? You need to come to church with me, and I'd say, no, Mom, I don't, and she'd say, yes, you do, and I'd say, no, I don't, and she'd say, yes, you do, and you know what? I did. <laughs> I finally got to the point, and I said, well, ain't nothing else working. The drugs ain't working. The alcohol ain't working. The, all this stuff ain't working. And I look at my mama, and she's got something that I don't have. Yeah. Yeah. So I went with her, and I sat there two or three Sundays. And then the preacher preached on the sower of the seeds. And I was sitting there going, I wish he'd hurry up. I got something at the house I need to run and get done. And boy, when he gave that off the call, something was, bam. Son, this is your last time. I've been dealing with you and dealing with you and dealing with you. And you keep rejecting me and rejecting me and rejecting me so you can live that lifestyle that's just destroying you to begin with. And I just went, I don't even remember getting up, preacher. All I remember is being at that aisle going, God, I surrender. Here I am. I don't know how I'm going to quit all I'm involved in. I don't know how I'm going to quit. 
but here's my soul. I'm trusting in you. I've heard about you all my life. Now, please help me. Please save me right now. And I heard that old woman behind me. All her, those 37 years of her praying and crying and pleading over me and begging me to come to the Lord and me rejecting her and being hateful to her and saying, no, no. It paid off. Yeah. Oh, man, she was a shouting, she was a hooting, she was a holler. And boy, right then, I just knelt down and I said, Lord, you're going to have to help me. I don't know how to do this thing. I know nothing about the Bible. I know nothing about it. I'm supposed to confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. I know nothing about your saving me by faith and not by my works, by grace through faith. I know none of this stuff. All I know is I'm just trusting you and giving it to you right now. Save us. And boy, he did. And I went to work the next day. And all my buddies that I used to go out with at lunchtime and do things we wasn't supposed to have been doing, they were sitting there with me at that morning break, and they said, Boy, what's wrong with you? Yeah. I said, I said, nothing. They said, what's wrong with you? You ain't right today. Nothing. Oh, come on, tell us. I'd have got saved yesterday. And they said, well, you still going to go out with us at lunch, ain't you? And I said, man, I don't know. I don't know. But I tell you what, God began to deal with me. And, then, and I told Deb's husband, Larry, at the time. He said, oh, you just under conviction. I didn't even know what conviction was, preacher. Yeah. I said, well, I don't know, but I went up and I asked the Lord to save me yesterday. And he was like, uh-huh. I don't believe you believe me. <laughs> Next day, he brought me a Bible. And he said, brother, you need to take this thing home and you need to read it. Because you're going to need it. And he was right. Man, I was going into withdrawals and convulsions and all this other stuff. And I would sit there at night and I would read that word. And like I told him... In the Joshua circle, a lot of times it was just like reading Chinese arithmetic. I didn't know what I was reading no more in the world. But little nuggets started appearing. Yeah. Little bit here. And I'd read a little bit more there. And I, and I was confused. And I was like, Lord, I'm just such a mess that God can't hang on to me. And then it agreed right. Well, he can hang on to me. Well, he has got me. And this is by faith. And that's because I trusted him. Ain't about what I'm doing. I'm trying to do right, but I know I'm not perfect. And boy, these things just kept laying boom, boom, boom on top of the other. And the Lord finally got me about a year later where I realized he had me. Because I went to I went to our preacher. He was an old pastor. He was a World War II veteran. He had been after me. He told me he would come to my house almost every Saturday. And I'd hide, and he'd say, well, I heard you in there. <laughs> but God put it on that old man's heart to come after me, to re be relentless, to keep coming after me and preaching to me and talking to me. And I'd say, go on, go on. But them words of his, they were sowing in my heart, and they were yeah. going down in there. And I tell you what, that old man, he became, used to, I would just soon see a rattlesnake crawl up the yard as I would have him pulled up. But then after I got saved, man, I fell in love with that old yes, man. Sir. I seen what a kind, caring man he was. And, and I seen the love of God and the strength that he had to keep on and on with somebody hateful like me. And when he went to baptize me, he went like that and he stopped right when he got into the water. And he said, boy, I was after you a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I'm thankful for a mother who prayed and cried and squalled over me and, and come to me. And I'm thankful for a faithful man of God who kept on and on. And he seen my hard heart and he seen the way I was living. And, and he kept on. Because why? Because he had a compassion. He had the love of Christ in him. He had a burden for my soul. And I'm so thankful that, you know what, I couldn't have committed none of things other. I couldn't have done none of the works that's been done. I don't do nothing. It's all God right. because I'm not smart enough to do none of these things. Y'all know me for a long time. I'm going amen right there. <laughs> but the first thing I had to do was commit my soul to him. Amen. Commit my spirit to him. I'm so thankful that the, that the girl was singing about grace for us. Yes. About the fear. You know what? Before I was saved I would try to cover up my fear, I would drink and, and I would do rock climbing and do crazy stuff and jump off cliffs and all this stuff. And I remember one day I looked over a cliff, I was fixing to jump off about 120 foot with a rope tied to me. 
And it went through my mind, what happened if that rope breaks? And it went through my mind, you're going straight on, you're going to hell if what's going to happen to you. And boy, I tell you what, and I would just suppress it. I would suppress it. But after I gave my heart to the Lord and after I trusted Jesus Christ my Savior, that fear that I would push down and I'd turn the music up and drown it out and I'd open a bottle and drown it out. But you know what? Once I gave my heart to the Lord, that fear just went, Amen, sir. Amen. it's gone. Amen. I didn't have to worry no more. I didn't have that fear and dread anymore like I did. <coughs> and I've committed my soul to him. And another thing I committed to him, and it's saying here, he said, you know, he said, see, I know I am have whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And over here in, I've committed my safety to him. Over here in verse 7, in chapter 1, it says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen. And I know y'all that know me saying, well, that sound mind part leaves you out. <laughs> and you're right. But that sound mind there has the idea of a disciplined mind, a self-controlled mind, not in myself, but be disciplined through the word and through prayer and commit my life to Christ. Because like I said, it said, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power in that sound mind. And talking about that disciplined mind, that came in four years ago. Carl and I were sitting doing what Baptists do. We were sitting on the side of the road eating fried chicken. <laughs> and heard a ruckus and said, what in the world was that? And seen about three or 400 people coming down the street and they were beating on cars and raising cane and hooting and hollering. And I thought, oh man, I ain't never seen that down here. And about that time we seen the, the, the police go by. They had the right gear on and the batons and their helmets and shields and all this stuff. And I said, man, it's time. And people were trying to get out of there everywhere. So we got home and come home and turned the TV on. And man, they were fires burning everywhere. They were looting, they were robbing. And what happened that they had tried to do something with the Social Security and the people just went nuts. And I thought, well, it'll get over in a couple of days. It didn't get over in a couple of days. It would, by the, that was on a Thursday and by that Saturday night I could stand out on my porch and I could watch in town and I could see the flames where they were burning all the government buildings and, and throwing all the police out and it, they just went crazy and run all order and everything out of town. Now, man, this get kind of rough. Got up Sunday morning, and Carla, she, uh, she'd been through this stuff before. I hadn't. And I said, well, let's turn the TV on and see what news says. She said, don't turn it on. I don't want to see it. I said, well, maybe it'll be better. And she said, it ain't going to be no better. So I turned it on. It wasn't no better. It was worse. And I walked out on my front porch, and I walked over to the corner about right here. And I said, Lord. Here I am, a gringo, in the middle of a Latino civil war. I'm afraid. God, help me. Give me the courage to do what I need to do because I don't have it. In your heart, in your hands, I commend my spirit right now. God, help me through this. And man, it just kept getting worse. And like next day, Carla said, run down to the store and get me a couple eggs. I walked down to the store, cut the corner. They had tore the road up and had tars burning. There's guys there with masks on with guns. And I went, well, we having rice for breakfast this morning, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Never been through that. But you know, with time and prayer, I got where I could walk by those guys with guns without fear. I got where I could crawl over the barricades without fear. I got where me and Carla could crawl under barbed wire over barricades around broken glass and have guns pointed at us without fear. That's not me. That's my Lord right there. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, brother. We, one time we were hemmed in the house for two weeks and couldn't get out. And I said, Carla, we have got to go see our people to church. We've got to go help and minister to these folks. And I said, you know what we got to walk through. We've got to walk through all these barricades and pass these guys with guns. And you don't know what they're going to do. I said, are you with me? She said, yes, I'm with you. <laughs> Well, what do you think you married? 
I married you to be a partner. I married you to do this. We'll do this together. So God gave us the strength to go through that. And one time we were in town, and we was eating chicken again. I need to quit eating this chicken. We went to go. <laughs> we were sitting there. We were trying to get her dad some money where he lived at and where he had started that second church. They didn't have the problems we did, and they could just go right on with their life, that little bitty area there. So I said, we need to send your dad some money to help him out with what's going on over there. She said, yes, so we went, and there was a line at, at the Western Union to lift the off church down that way and down that side. I said, well, let's go get us something to eat. So we were sitting there eating, and guys come flying by on motorcycles with guns going, attack, 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 attack. Everybody started throwing their shop windows shut, and the guy threw his uh, uh, window shut there at the restaurant, and he said, you and Carla come over here and get behind the, the wall with us. So we went back, got behind the wall, waited a few minutes, and nothing. The guy went over there and he peeped out the door and he said, them boys was messing with us. Because when the government would try to come in and throw the rebels out, the rebels would ring the church bells. We said, well, the church bells weren't ringing. So we left, we said, let's go send your daddy the money. And we walked out, my barber was sitting across the street there. I said, you got time to cut my hair? And he said, not today I don't. <laughs> said, come back later. So we got up to the corner we got up to the corner, maybe about as far from here to the back wall. Cling, 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 cling. I started ringing the church bell. And me and Carl went, oh, my God. So we went over here, and we got in a little stoop like this. And it was about that deep, and we just put our backs up against the wall like that. Carla said, I just knew that was my last day on earth. She was praying. And when them motorcycles coming straight at us. And a lot of time, if they were the paramilitary from the government, they would shoot into the crowds and just shoot folks. So we got up against the wall like that. That woman didn't scream. She didn't holler. Bravest woman I've ever met. And we got there, and the motorcycles got a half a block from us. Phew, turned this way. And when they turned that way, the government was coming that way. And you could just hear the AKs open up. And I told her, I said, come on. So we went over a block, up a block. I said, let's zigzag. I seen that on the movie. So I said, let's zigzag and get up out of here. <laughs> Until we got up to the main road, they were carrying bodies out from the firefight. And we got home, that barricade there where we're at, they were over it and they were pointing rifles at me and Carla when we come around the corner like that. I said, it's us, it's us. And that one guy said, I know them, I know them. And they said, well, you got to get out of here. And we said, well, we live right there. And Carla said, please let us across. And one of the guys I spoke to every morning when I went by to get eggs or something like that, when I'd say, brother, I love you and I'm praying for you. Because me and him spoke every day. And the other guys weren't going to let us through. And he said, I know him. And that guy said, well, you're responsible for this. And he said, I'll, I'll be responsible. So they over there and took a couple bricks down and, and throwed Carla over. And then they throwed me over. He said, you go home and don't you leave. Two days later, the government come in there and killed those guys. And I pray that they know the Lord. I told them I was praying for them, and I loved them, and told them about the Lord. They didn't even paint scripture on their walls and stuff. But I said all that to say this, that God gave me the courage Amen. to do all those things. I was not capable of those things. I am not capable. I'd go now and somebody put a gun on me now, I'd probably go off. But the Lord gave me the strength. I have never felt the peace like I felt in the middle of all that. And like I said, I've been searched, had guns pointed at me, and God gave me strength through all these things. Amen. He gave me safety. You know, uh, Psalm 37, uh, 34, 7 says, the angel of the Lord kept round about them yes, that fear him and delivered Amen. them. He delivered my, Carla and I out of so many things. And like I said, she would get home and she would just go nervous and start shaking and like that. But God gave us the peace and God gave us the Amen. courage. You know, no matter what, you may never get in a civil war and I hope you don't. But you never know what you're liable to face tomorrow. And it seems unsurmountable. And you seem like I can't face it. And I can't go through it. You can't. But the Lord that you trust will carry you through it. It's a promise. If he carried us through the things that he did, he'll carry you.
of whatever you're facing. Amen. And it's so easy for us to say, well, trust in the Lord, yeah. do good, sure. and all this stuff. Yeah. But till it comes and lands on your That's front exactly steps, right. and you're standing yeah. in the middle of the fire, then all of a sudden, but then all of a sudden, the preaching like you've heard from this man right here is going to start coming in there and say, well, you know, the pastor said this. He told me to trust, and he told me God was with me. He'll never leave me nor forsake me, and he's always with me. And you know what? He'll give you the strength, and he'll give you the courage to get you through those things, no matter what you're facing. The God that you serve can bring you through it. And like I said, me and Carla... Like she said, well, one day she said, I just knew this was my last day on earth. But we looked at it like, well, if we died doing this, we were trying to do the Lord's will. And we knew that if something happened, we were going to open our eyes in glory. We had no fear of, of what man could do to us because we were trusting in the one that could destroy the body and the soul in hell. And he had us. He had us in his hand. And I'm so thankful for that. And up here... Well, also committed my service to him. Amen. When I started this thing, I had, I knew God had called me. I had went to Bible college. I was preparing. And then I kind of started saying, well, it'd be a little bit easier if I just wait. You know, if I just wait a little bit longer. You know, if I wait just a little bit more. Then I come home one day and I seen all these boxes on my front porch and I said, Oh boy, my son's moving in with my grandson. That's what I said. I opened my door and walked in, and my house was empty. All of a sudden, my family you, and everything, you, as a Christian man, my family was everything to me. I wanted to hold everything together. I wanted to be that husband and that father that I needed to be. And I walked in, and there was nothing I could do. It was all gone. And I was devastated. And I just held on. I would pray, and I would still teach Sunday school. And I said, well, my God called me to the mission field, but after this has happened, it's over. It's done. Won't nobody have nothing to do with me. <laughs> but a friend of mine called me, and he said, I'm going, I want you to go Nick Rock with me. I know you've been, and I've heard you tell of the things, and the folks getting saved down there. I want you to take me. And I said, no. He said, well, I'm going to pray about it. And I'm going to call you back. And I said, well, you can pray about it, and you can call me back, but I'm going to tell you no. Well, he prayed about it, and he called me back, and I told him no. And then he called me again, he said, listen, brother. He said, I've been out in the woods, and I've been on my knees before God, and I've been praying. And he tells me, God has pressed upon my spirit, that if you take me and help me minister down there, and you go, God's got healing for you. You can get out of your ash pile, and you can take your sackcloth off. And I said, that's okay. I'm still not going. And he kept on. And he kept aggravating me. And I finally said, well, my passport's wore out. My preacher said, well, we'll get you another one. I said, yeah. So I went down there. And I finally said, okay, you aggravating rascal, let's go. And I went down there, and we'd done Bible school and had some children saved, and that was all great. See that lady sitting back there? Well, she was cooking for us. And uh, last night, I was going to buy dinner for everybody, and I told her her sister was the interpreter. Now, she don't speak no English, but her sister speaks good English. <coughs> Excuse me. And I said, tell everybody to just bring their husbands and their wives, and I'll take everybody out to eat tonight. Because if you don't, 75 Nicaraguans are going to show up if you take them one out to eat. And I told her sister, I said, tell your sister, Joseph was just a little rascal then. I said, tell your sister to get her husband and to come out and go out and eat with us tonight and bring Joseph. And she said, she don't have no husband. I said, well, tell her to bring her boyfriend. Well, she don't have no boyfriend neither. I said, and she said, well, you be her boyfriend. I said, no, 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 no. And a friend of mine kept on. And we talked a little bit. I knew about eight Spanish words. And I thought I asked her, are you going to be at church tomorrow? And she said, no, I don't know what I asked her, preacher. <laughs> she ain't never told me. But anyway, she was at church the next morning. And preacher, I had been so burdened down and so heartbroken and so just thought God is just done with me. Sure. And I heard that lady start singing. And it done something to me. Not, not. Personally, toward her, it's just when her singing, 
the Spirit of God just went, and it's just like that burden went. And Kenny, the guy that was with me, that had me take down, he was preaching. And the only thing I remember him saying was coming out from under that tarp and going, God, are you hearing our prayers? And boy, right then, something hit me. And I had been praying for almost a year. God, help me through this. Help me. Help yes. me. Yes. He said, here it is. Yes. Right here. And I went, oh, God. And I come back to church next week. Went in church, walked into a fine building like this, sat down, and that burden and that pressure and that pain and that heartache just settled back over me again. Went, the preacher turned around and said, what's wrong with you? I said, man, I said, I felt so good in church out in the jungle last week. I said, and praising the Lord first time in months, I'd raise my hand in praise. And I said, and now I come in this fine building, and it, ah. He said, well, you just where you supposed to be in last week. Yeah. <laughs> and then at that point, I started praying, and I started fasting. I was saying, God, show me. Is this what I'm supposed to do? Show me. And I would go, and, I, and a pastor friend of mine, he was such help, and he was an encouragement. He, knew, he, he kept saying, brother, bro, he would always give me good biblical advice. And I'd go to some churches and they'd say, okay, sounds good, sounds good. You've been married? And I'd say, yeah. And, oh, well, we'll see you. We'll get back oh, with yeah. you. We'll get back oh, with yeah. you. Don't you worry. We're getting, yeah. yeah. And I thought, man, I'm not going to be able to. You know what? I wasn't able to do this preaching. Right. But folks like y'all said, you know what? We're going to take a shot with that guy. Yeah. And other folks said, you know what? We're going to take a chance on him. And, everybody, and, and then friends of mine said, bro, you go down there, we're going to help you. So I sold everything I had, put what I had left in two suitcases, got a ticket, went to Nicaragua. That was eight years ago. Amen. With eight people in a little room. And now sometimes we have several hundred folks, got two, two buildings that God has built, God has provided, God has done this, God built this, and God sent this person to help, and God sent that person to help, and we just trusted and fed folks and, and loved on folks, and, and I was telling them there was one guy, he passed away during COVID, and I loved him, his name was Goyito. I loved that man, and he had Parkinson's so bad, he couldn't, and I'd stop by every other day and shave him. And just do stuff like that. And the folks said, you know what? That gringo ain't so bad after all. <laughs> and then one guy started calling me, Pastor. And I said, man, don't do that. I just don't feel that. And he said, well, listen. He said, you feed us. You get us in out to dry. When we don't have tin on the roof, you come put tin on the roof. If we ain't got medicine, you feed us. And our old folks, you go shave them and take care of them. And you tell us about the Lord. He said, that's a pastor. Amen. And pastor in Spanish is sex shepherd and pastor is the same that? word oh, in wow. Spanish. So he said, you're our pastor, you're our shepherd. Amen. You take care of us, so that's what you are. And I was like, no. But, but God just opened these doors Amen, and took care of so much stuff. And like I said, it's none of me. And, and Carla and I, sometimes we feed 100 families a week. And we make sure the kids get eight. And we'll do little feeding kitchen, and we'll bring the kids in, and we'll feed them, and we'll, I'll play with them, and hug on them, and Carla loves on them, and play with them, and pick with them. And a lot of these kids have homes that are abusive, and if there's a father in the home, he's a drunk, and he's abusive. We had one little boy come to our feeding kitchen, and he said, he, he said well, my daddy told me to be a man, I got to drink beer and hit women. This child was like three or four years old. So Carl and I are trying to take what negative and godless evil stuff that is being taught in them homes and show them children some love. Amen. Show them some kindness. Amen, Give them a meal. Hug on them. Tell them we love them. And tell them, no, that's not right. You don't hit women. You don't drink liquor. You keep your mind clear. You put Christ first. So that's what we're trying to, that's the service that we're trying to do is to teach a lot of them adults we can't get through to, but we can try to get through to them children and save this next and do for this next generation. And also, I've committed my soul unto him. I've committed my safety and my service. And also what I commit to him is the souls of others. 
in Ezekiel 33, 8 says this. It says, when I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou does not speak unto, to warn the wicked from his ways, that wicked man shall die in his iniquities, but his blood will I require at thine hands. If I don't warn these folks that there is judgment coming, God's a loving God. He's standing there with wide open arms right now to receive you. No, he won't cast out nobody. If he'll take me, he'll take anybody. Trust me. But God is standing there with wide open arms. But if we keep rejecting like I did, preacher, and rejecting, I thank God. I can never thank him, never be grateful enough for him kept giving me a chance. I had one somebody in my Sunday school class ask me one time, well, why did God give you so many opportunities? Grace. Amen. Grace. And I'm so thankful for that. And I have lost loved ones. And I tell you what, I was seeing this one young man over here. I can't remember which one, but I've seen him from the side, and he looked just like one of my family members that's lost when he was young. And oh, it just broke my heart. And I just want that burden and that compassion and the love and, and the straightforwardness and the boldness to speak the truth, but in love. Man, that I can reach these folks because, I mean, I tell you what, I have loved ones that I love so dearly that I'm so afraid for. I'm so fearful of what could happen to them. And I just want the Lord to help me every day to have a burden for lost folks, to, give, to have the right words to speak to them, have the right compassion, and be straightforward with them, but not just be in the judgeable hate, but but speak the truth in love. I remember one time before I got saved, I was down at my dad's in his basement putting an axe in my axe handle, and my hair was down about right here, and their preacher come by, and mama said, my son's down there, she sicked him on me. And he come down there, and I was you know, with my dad over there working on the axe handle, and dad said, there's the new preacher. And uh, I went to go shake his hand, and he done this, Skip. I went to go shake his hand. He looked up and down at that hair and said, boy, you going straight to hell. And I hadn't spoke a word yet. My, my. He was right. I was going to hell. But with that, it just, oh, it just done something to me. And for years, I was so, I mean, that didn't help. But I'm so thankful that through working with Christian folks Amen. like Skip and other folks that I've seen a different side. I seen a Christian can love you, even though you're not, even though you're still a heathen, but they can still love you and care about you and have compassion on you. And boy, that's what I want. I want to love sinners and and, and not condone what they're doing, but show them, man, man, God loves you and He's standing there with open arms for you. And I just thank y'all for taking care of me and Carla and, and, and taking us on and supporting us all these years and, and, and loving us and praying for us. I mean, I can never tell you enough how much we appreciate you guys. And I watched Pastor Cody preaching way down there, and he puts me under conviction way down there. So he goes 3,000 miles to stomp on my toes all the way down there. And I, and I thank you for that, preacher. But I love you guys. And I'm going to hand it back over to you, Pastor. And I just thank y'all for giving me the opportunity. And I thank you for trusting me to yes, stand sir. here, brother. Honor, my brother. And uh, I love you. I love you, too. And I thank you.